Well, with this video, we will wrap up exploration of uh, simulations and the sampling of phase space employing Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics techniques. So I'd like to come back to this issue that those two processes, techniques, tools, if you will, Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics, are a means to integrate over phase space in an in a efficient or useful way. And I'll remind you that the desire we have is to find an expectation value, so that's an average type value, and that such values are dictated by probabilities of being in different regions of phase space. So remember that a region of phase space is a a combination of structures and momenta. And so when you say you're in a region of phase space, you mean that you have some sort of structure or nearby structures, and perhaps uh, if it's a momentum-dependent property, the atoms are moving in a similar way. And mathematically, we want to solve for this expectation value by integrating over phase space the property we're interested in, capital C, weighted by the probability of being there, evaluated for every point in phase space, and then this is just a normalization factor on the probability if it doesn't integrate to 1. And in a Boltzmann uh, weighted way, the probability is associated with the energy, and the energy is a function of the position coordinates and the momentum coordinates, divided by Boltzmann's constant in the temperature, so here's where temperature enters in. And uh, just as a shorthand notation, we call this integral over phase space of the probability function Q, the partition function. And the point was that you don't want to waste a lot of time evaluating a property at a position R in phase space if the probability of being at that position is near zero, because it won't really be contributing much to the integral. So the, uh, the trick is to find means that allow you to evaluate C only in places where it's really contributing to the expectation value. And I won't go through the little hyperoctant argument again about how hard it can be to do that sampling. I do want to pause for one moment and mention that uh, often when you do a simulation, because you have all of these points that are contributing to an expectation value, you don't just report the average, but you report a standard deviation. And occasionally people will look at that standard deviation and think of it as an error. So, for instance, a dipole moment, that's what's being plotted down here, for a particular molecule might be reported as 3 plus or minus 1 to buy. And you could say, oh, well, so uh, I don't know exactly what it is to an error of better than a to buy because there's this plus or minus, and of course, that's a one sigma deviation typically, but let's not do statistics tonight. Uh, however, in fact, part of it is indeed perhaps associated with error, but Part of it is also associated with just dynamic behavior. So if I have a molecule that is moderately floppy, then at a given temperature, it will explore a number of different conformations in a Boltzmann-weighted way. And if they have a range of different dipole values, I would generate a plot like this. This is a histogram, if you like, the probability of an individual dipole moment. And in a computer, typically you do it as a histogram. You have little bins, and you just number up how many times did it fall in this bin, how many times in this bin. And from that, you will get some sort of a distribution. You could plot it as a continuous function at that stage, but this is an indication of the raw data that would come out of a simulation file. And remember, a simulation file is just point after point, whether on a molecular dynamics trajectory or a Monte Carlo simulation, of what's the position of all the atoms, what's the momentum of all the atoms, if you're keeping track of that, and what's the value of the various properties you may also be computing. So, uh, I, I want to finish off here with a little bit of a compare and a contrast exercise. What is different about molecular dynamics compared to Monte Carlo and how are they similar? So I'll, I'll ask you to remember that with molecular dynamics the point of the simulation is to develop the output file, I guess I'll think of it again in that sense, is as a function of time, so every point in my output file will represent a new time step in following some trajectory, and I'll get the positions of all the atoms, the velocities of all the atoms. I can compute the energy given that I have the positions because I have a force field that depends on uh, those positions. I can also compute correlation functions, that is, uh, functions that measure how a property at one time depends on a property at a certain point uh, in previous time. And such functions say something about how properties decay, for instance how much memory is there in the property. And because I'm doing this as a function of time, I can explore those sorts of things.
Uh, I do get to watch sort of dynamic structure evolution. So I can look at a molecule and over time ask, does it turn into another molecule? Does a reaction happen? Uh, and I can study various time-dependent properties, transport properties, for instance. So the viscosity uh, is one example, the diffusivity. These are all things that uh, have time in their units. Uh, and the tricks that are used in running a molecular dynamics, and, and tricks in quotes here because we're not uh, doing bad science or anything. This is uh, just the, the computational way that you can impose the sorts of constraints that you would have in a laboratory. So for instance, you can hold the temperature at a constant value or hold the pressure at a constant value or, or various state variables. And so the, the words you'll hear associated with this would be which ensemble are you sampling with your dynamics? And so ensembles are dictated by which state variables are being controlled. And so you can have a heat bath, for instance, to give rise to a constant temperature. You can have thermostats. You can have pistons, which give rise to constant pressure. And when I say constant, by the way, that's uh, the intent is to hold something constant. If you actually look at the simulation, you're constantly sort of scaling, rescaling to get things back to the value you'd like. But during the simulation, there's going to be some fluctuation. So that's a bit on the technical side, and we don't need to dwell on that. Another issue in the simulation is, let's say that I was interested in simulating this molecule here. So this is a very small fragment of polyethylene oxide. Uh, I think this is, let's see, that is ethane diol in there. And there's a common name for the dimethyl ether of uh, ethane diol, and it's temporarily escaping me, so we won't worry about that. But in any case, uh, Polyethylene oxide is a common uh, polymer that's used in surgery, for instance, in making biocompatible sorts of materials. It is relatively hydrophilic because of the uh, presence of lots of oxygen atoms. And so you might be interested in doing a simulation to understand its structure in water, as an example. And so here it is, surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight water molecules. Well, if you wanted to really understand its behavior in water, Eight molecules is just woefully too few. And the problem is that these water molecules, which you're sort of calling solvent, well, while they do see this uh, diether underneath them, they see on their other side vacuum, right? You're, you're really not simulating the bulk. You'd be simulating a cluster. And clusters can be interesting. There's lots of interesting atmospheric chemistry involving clusters. But you're not really doing a simulation of the bulk liquid. On the other hand, and so, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. You could just add more solvent molecules, put in an X shell and an X shell and an X shell, and you can go a long way, but uh, the computational effort to start moving around all those atoms starts to increase. And in addition, if you think about it, you're sort of using your time for the wrong things. You're really quite interested in this little solute molecule here, which is in this cluster, maybe it's 40% of the atoms. And if you decide that you're going to add 10 to the fourth more solvent molecules, and hence uh, the number of solvent atoms outnumbers the number of interesting atoms, we'll call them, by orders of magnitude, most of the time you're going to be moving around solvent atoms, uh, whether through a trajectory or through Monte Carlo sampling, and who really cares about that? You want to focus on your solute. And so one trick that's used in simulations to address this is something called periodic boundary conditions. And so that's a way to create an an artificial crystal, if you will. A crystal because you create a bulk structure that has symmetry associated with it. So this central cell here, if you closely inspect all these other cells, they are designed to look as though they are exact copies. It's not quite perfect, the drawing here. But in any case, all the molecules in this cell are translated into this cell, same geometries, same relative orientation, uh, relative to one another, that is. And a cutoff could be employed, for example, to ensure that this water molecule doesn't interact with itself. That is, I wouldn't go over here and have this hydrogen interact with this hydrogen because it's really the same hydrogen. That would be a, a bad sort of interaction to have. Instead, you would uh, look out a certain distance and instead of vacuum for this water molecule over here, it sees maybe this water molecule. Well, that's just fine. So you run your simulation on the central cell and yet, whenever you need to look at a interaction, you extend out into surrounding cells, which are periodically reproduced. And indeed, you can uh, uh, gain 
special efficiencies with this. Because of periodicity, you may be able to take advantage of uh, Fourier transforms of plane waves that are going to be used for certain kinds of quantities that are being computed. Uh, but this is quite common, then, to use periodic boundary conditions. Now, if you make your unit cells too small, now the crystallinity that you're imposing may, in fact, uh, lead to problems because you're studying a, a sort of an artificial system. It's not really like a homogeneous solution. It's more like some weird quasi-crystal. Not, not like the kind that won the Nobel Prize, but just a, an unusual system that has periodicity it shouldn't. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a very common and successful technique with large enough unit cells. Another problem is a so-called quasi-ergodic sampling. And what quasi-ergodic means is that you're doing just fine in terms of ergodicity within a given well on a potential energy surface, so you'll explore it in a proper Boltzmann-weighted way. But the trouble is that there is at least one other well somewhere that you never get to during your simulation, presumably because some barrier was just too high, or in the case of Monte Carlo, where it's, it's less about barriers, you just were never lucky enough to take a proper movement that would have put you into this other well. So here's a low well, and I'm busy ergodically sampling this high well. And I never find out that this is actually the best place for the system to be. And so that'll happen at, at lower temperatures in particular, because the Boltzmann weighting will be very heavily towards the lowest energy regions in that section of the potential energy surface. You, you just can't get over here if you never try to get over there. So uh, nature, of course, has a nifty solution to that. Uh, you run your simulation forever. Uh, so time goes out to infinity. Uh, that's the real world for you in macroscopic amounts of time. We don't have that luxury on a computer because the computer isn't that fast. Uh, and so that's a, an issue one has to try to get around. Now, coming back to the compare and contrast aspects, so this is just a drawing. It's not meant to necessarily indicate anything special. But I want to mention a couple of items uh, for, for food for thought. So one issue is that in order to follow a trajectory, Molecular dynamics needs to know the forces on the atoms. And remember that the force involves the first derivative of the potential energy function. So force is negative the first derivative in uh, coordinate direction. On the, and another thing uh, associated with molecular dynamics is that you have to do a global update. And what that means is every time step I take, every single atom in my simulation is moving. So they all, every atom has a velocity, presumably, or if just by sheer luck the velocity is temporarily zero, it's about to get pulled or pushed or bumped by something, and it is going to move soon. So each line in the massive data file that I'm generating with my simulation contains a, a position for every atom and a velocity for every atom, and I need to update those at every step. Now, Monte Carlo, uh, by contrast, lends itself pretty well uh, to simple models. And one of its nice features is it does not need a derivative. So remember that when you take a Monte Carlo step, you choose to move something either in a direction or through a rotation of some sort. And you evaluate its energy, and you compare it to a prior energy. But at no point do you need to take any first derivatives to learn anything about forces. It's all about energies. And so that uh, is speedier than having to calculate both energies and derivatives. And then another nice feature, of course, is that the Monte Carlo update is not global. If I come back to my idea of a, uh, an ethylene glycol ether in a box full of water, and my Monte Carlo move consists of moving one of the water molecules, well, I don't need to recompute the energy associated with the ethylene glycol interacting with any of the other water molecules that haven't been moved. They're all still in the same place. They all still have the same energy contribution. So really, the only thing I have to do is write down what's different, what changed. So I'll calculate the energy change because of my moved water molecule. But that's all I have to do. And I also don't have to uh, recompute all the coordinates. So that, too, is, is speedy. Of course, the downside of Monte Carlo is that there is no time. These steps you take are not associated with time. They are just uh, dictated by how large moves you're willing to allow and what sort of moves you're willing to allow. And so if you're interested in time-dependent properties, well, you're sunk. Monte Carlo is, is not your friend for that. So in general, what method uh, should one adopt? So here's a, a good way to think about almost any problem you might address in computational chemistry. 
And that is that you have some length scale you're interested in, and that scale may range from the atomic scale, where you're really thinking about individual atoms uh, and nuclei and their electrons. Here's a little Bohr electron uh, orbiting about a, a nucleus. All the way up to quite large length scales, uh, the mesoscale, for instance. So you'd be doing, well, 10 to the minus fourth meters. That's a tenth of a millimeter. That's a pretty large thing from a, a chemistry standpoint, millions and millions of molecules. Uh, and also something on a, a time scale question. So if you think of the time it takes for an electron, for instance, to orbit a nucleus, that's actually less than a picosecond, which is what's here. But in any case, uh, we may have very short time scale uh, motions. Picoseconds are uh, like a few molecular vibrations. So a molecular vibration is typically just sub picosecond. And here we have up to microseconds. And of course, it just goes on and on further than that. And where you fall in this sort of continuum has some influence on what you choose to do from a modeling perspective. So way out here at the high end, which is either very long time scale or very long length scale or both, I've actually got something here called continuum. So in continuum, you just forget about your atomistic representation of matter, for example, and you adopt uh, approximations associated with everything being smooth and homogeneous in some way. We're actually going to see how to use that for... Uh, for understanding salvation effects later in the class, but I won't say more about it here. Instead, what I'll say is Monte Carlo is particularly useful as an equilibrium simulation technique, if you recall. And equilibrium, sort of by its name, implies that you're operating on a reasonably large time scale. That is, you have the time to come to equilibrium. And so Monte Carlo is, is uh, certainly a, a useful choice when equilibrium properties are what's interesting. As I've uh, just mentioned in the last slide, of course, if you care about time, time-dependent, time-dependent quantities, you want to watch things evolve over time, molecular dynamics is your only choice. And, of course, you may discover for certain kinds of problems, you can creatively combine Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics sampling to uh, achieve the best of both worlds without necessarily uh, achieving also the worst of, of each of their individual uh, drawbacks. So that's, a, that's, again, moving a bit more technical than I'd, I'd like to go, but there are opportunities to uh, restrict your attention in certain parts of a system to different time and length scales. I think all I'll mention is a phrase you may see in the literature sometimes is called coarse graining. And in a coarse grain model, what you do is you attempt to work at large scales or large time, whether those scales be time or distance, by creating potentials, so you have some sort of potential energy function, for example, that moves big pieces, not necessarily atoms, but that function itself would be derived from some kind of bootstrapping technique where you would break up the domains into still smaller pieces, look at their behavior with some uh, shorter time, shorter length scale model like molecular dynamics, for instance, the one I'm pointing at here, and then use that to inform your development of the coarse grain model. So there is this kind of smooth continuation that you can imagine in terms of modeling systems as they span these length and time scales. And so multi-scale modeling it, uh, continues to be uh, regarded as a, a significant challenge in the community today. All right, I want to wrap up. I'm just going to show this one slide for the third, or maybe it's even the fourth time now, and really emphasize that the issue with Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics is you are trying to generate a sample, a sample that allows you to solve an integral over phase space to compute an expectation value, typically more than one expectation values, but here's uh, the correct mathematical form for a given expectation value. And both Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics are designed so that the solution of this equation does not require you to just randomly pick points R in phase space, compute the probability of being there, which remember depends on the energy, because you don't want to do that. The issue is so much of phase space is a wasteland that again and again and again, if, so if you pick with equal weight, that is, you just take every point that you can imagine, that's an equal weight because you're going to consider every point you pick. So I would pick points with equal probability and then I go and I look at their energy and I plug it in and I also compute the property and I just keep adding it up because an integral is like an infinite sum. Uh, well, that's a bad thing to do because I'll constantly be multiplying times zero. On the other hand, what Monte Carlo does is it says, you know what, I won't put in every point R. 
Instead, I will evaluate the energies of points R and throw away R points that fail to generate a probabilistic distribution. So instead of picking with equal probability, you pick with weighted probability and then plug them in and compute for each, each point you retain what's the value. And since you chose the points in a probabilistically weighted fashion, you can just divide and the average of all your points is the expectation value. And then molecular dynamics relies on the ergodic hypothesis, which says that a dynamics trajectory integrated over a long enough time will sample phase space in an ergodic fashion. And I, I should note, by the way, that is just a hypothesis. You can show for some very specific and very simple uh, model systems that physicists have played with that the ergodic hypothesis is true. You can actually rigorously prove it. There is no proof for an arbitrary system, but there's a lot of faith, and uh, sometimes there is faith in science. Uh, certainly, no one has yet disproven it, and that's, uh, well, that's what we're relying on at this stage. So that, again, a molecular dynamics trajectory would be, you just keep taking time steps now, so this capital M runs over time steps, where in Monte Carlo it runs over uh, Monte Carlo steps, and you take the average of all the points that you accumulate, uh, and same, same evaluation. So uh, that's where I'm going to wrap up for dynamics, and we'll probably play a bit with some practical exercises to try to get a better feel for some of the compare and contrast and utility. And we're going to look at a paper from the literature, which is hopefully also going to provide some insights. See you in class.